me and my girlfriend, Mackie, on the summit of Monte Perdido in the Pyrenees, just after I proposed to her. We had been living apart together for four years, me in Falmouth and Mackie in Madrid. Normally, I would fly out to spend time with her. But for our wedding, I wanted to cycle from my home in Falmouth to hers in Madrid. I'd cycled very little in the last eight years, so physically I wasn't really prepared for this trip. I was anticipating some hardship for the first few days. At Plymouth I bought a ferry ticket to Roscoff and then had a few hours to rest and dry out. On the crossing I had a hot shower and a good sleep, but I was disappointed to see the weather hadn't changed. In Roscoff I took the Velodicy 1 cycle route. This would take me all the way to the Spanish border at Ondai, but for today I was hoping just to get as far as Karai. A few miles out of Roscoff, I lost the cycle route, so I decided to stop and have some breakfast. Although the GPS had led me off route, it did also show that if I followed this road, it would take me to Morlaix. In Morlaix, I stopped at the tourist office to have a break from the awful weather and get information on the cycle route ahead. This abandoned railway station offered shelter from the rain, somewhere to have a break and dry out my clothes. At Kahai, I was able to have my first video chat with Mackie since leaving Falmouth. For the next few days, I would be following the canals across Brittany. I had planned to navigate solely by GPS, but this didn't work out, and I ended up relying on tourist information offices for maps to the cycle route.
After passing through Rohan, I continued for another hour or so, looking for somewhere to spend the night. Eventually, I decided to sleep in this shed next to the canal. A few miles beyond Redon, I found a lovely waterside bivouac site. Some of the neighbours didn't appear to welcome my presence. The physical effort of the last few days caught up with me this morning. I found a quiet spot by the canal and relaxed for several hours. I realised there was a problem with the bike which I didn't have the tools for. Fortunately, the next day I would arrive in Nantes where I should be able to get it seen to. I spent part of the afternoon exploring Nantes, but as it was Sunday, cycle shops were closed. I decided to stay the night at a campsite in the city. In the morning, I found somewhere to get the bike fixed. My cycle was now repaired, but I was off route. I decided to go directly down to the river, as the map indicated a river crossing at Cueron. This river crossing turned out to be a ferry rather than the bridge I was expecting. This section from Nantes to Saint-Nazaire followed the southern bank of the River Loire and offered long flat roads with no traffic. As I left the Loire 
and turned south along the Atlantic coast. There was a great improvement in the weather. After Les Moutiers and Reds, I lost the cycle route and ended up wandering away from the coast. This landscape is typical of the Vendée, offering great cycling but not many options for a wild cow. I camped just outside the village of Bois de Seine. I decided to cut across country to the coast where I could pick up the cycle route again, and along the way I stopped in Chalons to replace the pedals which had developed a problem. I cycled through the afternoon and evening and saw absolutely no possibilities for anywhere to bivouac. Just after sunset I crossed the river on a footbridge which had two concrete pontoons which offered a perfect place for me to sleep. A pair of western whip snakes, probably mating. They're not venomous but can be aggressive. At Rochefort, the ferry across the river had closed for the day. Just after sunset, I found this observatory building in the marshes which offered shelter for the night. Now the route was an asphalt track that ran through the sand dunes and coastal pine forests. At Royan, I took the ferry across the mouth of the river Gironde 
and after a good meal I continued southwards until after dark. I was beginning to feel the beneficial effects of cycling, though one thing wasn't improving. How many hours I could ride each day depended on how much I could tolerate the discomfort of the saddle. Of this coast the sea looks dangerous for swimming. In contrast, the freshwater lakes just a few kilometres inland offer perfect conditions. Not a very good night. <laughs> Mosquitoes and rain and crazy dogs. I had my first glimpse of the Basque Mountains. This bivouac even had an ensuite.
I was in Spain, I would have to improvise my route, avoiding roads as much as I could. This map was the only information I had on the Bidasoa cycle route, which I was going to follow towards Pamplona. Between heavy showers, I cycled up an increasingly steep track through the beautiful Parquet Natural de Bertie. This was followed by a very steep descent which, I later found out, brought me full circle to where I had started going uphill. There were several more long climbs on rough tracks, as well as occasional stretches on the main roads. Crazy day, crazy day. It was better not to think about how far I still had to go and the progress I was making. I took a number of wrong turns, which forced me to backtrack. The mud was sticking to the tyres, making it difficult to cycle or even to push the bike. The mud got even worse, and the tyres seized up completely. I spent 20 minutes or so scraping off the mud, but exactly the same thing would happen again after moving another 20 feet. I ended up carrying my bike and bags up one particularly muddy hill. In Pamplona I was advised to take the N121 to Tadela, where I could join a cycle route to Tarazona. I decided to stop for the night in this derelict army barracks. The buildings were unsafe, so I slept on this veranda. The morning was cold and showery, but the road was good with light traffic. As I approached Tadella there was a heavy rainstorm. I sheltered from the worst of the rain for an hour before searching out the tourist information office. 
The cycle route from Tudela to Tarazona was the first section of a longer cycle route, the Camino Antonino, which extended all the way to Soria. After cycling for 20 days, I was feeling fit, but I was also constantly hungry. It was raining heavily when I arrived in Tarazona, so I sheltered in this disused railway shed on the edge of town. I didn't know where the next section of the Camino started, so I needed to wait until the next morning to ask for the tourist information. I didn't fancy sleeping here, so I cycled a few miles back down the Camino to Bivouac. After a hearty breakfast, I got directions for the next part of the cycle route to Soria. I had to stop and redo the patch on the rear tyre. From Tarazona, I was going to take the Camino Antonino over the mountains to Soria. This freshwater spring is the second most powerful spring in Europe. The Camino climbed a thousand metres onto the Meseta and travelled through one of the most vastly populated areas of Spain. I bivouacked on top of one of the forested hills that surround the agricultural plains. At over 1,000 metres it was the coldest night of the trip. I spent some time in Soria researching my onward route. In the end I realised I had to actually leave the city to the east as all the exits to the southwest were motorway. Towards the end of the day I was able to connect with Maki. She reminded me that I had to be in Madrid in two days time so I had to cover the final 250 kilometres to Madrid in the next two days. I reached Nole in the dark and decided to sleep in this old wash house. The afternoon was really hot, getting into the mid-thirties. I had to take regular breaks to cool down.
After stopping in Jadrakay to get some food, I carried on cycling till 1am, having covered 160 kilometres. I slept for about four hours on this roundabout on a disused industrial estate near Guadalajara. Today I was relying entirely on my GPS to navigate. After Guadalajara, the GPS led me onto motorway service roads. Just outside the town of Meco, I had my first sight of the Four Towers of Madrid. Trying to follow the GPS and navigate through heavy traffic at the same time was really stressful. My spirits lifted when I saw this sign, as this road passes close to Mackie's flat. What I didn't know is that it is one of the longest roads in Madrid and that I still had a distance to go. I found myself racing with the rush hour traffic. Thank <laughs> you. 